Hello, hello. I'm sorry, please don't think I'm distracted. I'm trying to find a document for you guys. Please share in the chat. Um, oh, hi, Martina. Uh, questions you may have, um, I'm going to share with you in the handouts. There is already um, there are already a couple of things for you. The um, EX Health Equity Audits Overview, our six goals of educational equity, and a brochure for the Technical Assistance Center here at IDRA. I want to give you a brief overview of of the EX South. I'm just trying to find one more document that I just created for you. And for some reason, I cannot find it. Um, but I don't want to, hmm, very strange. Very, very strange. You should have the ability, you know what? You should have the ability to chat with me. So please feel free to drop any questions in the chat. Um, and I will just share with you a few pieces of information from the handouts. So the IDRA EX South, again, is a technical assistance center that provides technical assistance and professional development and support for school districts across the US South. And our goal is to help districts address issues of equity related to race, gender, national uh, national origin and religion. So national origin traditionally um, has uh, encompassed language and sometimes culture, but when there are um, students who are not receiving adequate services, uh, especially our emergent, emergent bilinguals or placement, that is one area of technical assistance that we are able to provide under race that also includes disproportional school discipline, access to academic programs, um, disparities in hiring practices for school districts. Um, but we use a lot of, we use a variety of indicators beyond the four um, race, gender, national origin and religion. Sometimes it brings in facilities usage. We work with a lot of school districts who are under desegregation orders from the Department of Education through the Department of Justice or the Office for Civil Rights, as well as other uh, legal entities such as um, MALDEF or the Southern Poverty Law Center. So we work with the district and the uh, entity, the jurisdictional entity, to come to some sort of agreement as to what um, what the school district will be responsible for and how we might be able to help. So that's a little bit about what we do as far as technical assistance. When it comes to our equity audits, we work collaboratively with school districts in order to achieve successful outcomes, you know, according to their goals and objectives. Um, and so we are not able to provide all of our services um, that IDRA does. And this is where I just have to distinguish between the two. IDRA is a nonprofit that has been in existence since I think 1973. Um, the first EACs were established in 1975 and IDRA has held an EAC grant since 1975. First it was national origin, then I believe in 1975 race was added, and then somewhere later on um, we pulled in national origin and religion from the Department of Education. So IDRA is an educational nonprofit that seeks to um, eradicate inequities as far as fair funding, um, bilingual student education, English learner or emergent learner, uh, in, emergent bilingual education, but just quality instruction for all students. We really mean all means all. Um, so we provide, like I came in as a math educator. I've been in education for over 26 years and I was a math trainer. Um, the equity work is something that crosses our policy and family and community engagement practice um, a strategic team 
our communications, our evaluation research and data team, and then I'm on the educational practice team. I'm a senior education associate. So equity is built into everything that we do. We happen to also have a grant from the Department of Education uh, to provide these services around equity issues. And the thing about our technical assistance, there are four regional uh, EACs and our services are free to the district. Um, that is, that's one of the reasons why I just truly love my work because what we do is free for districts. We are able to partner with districts across the U.S. South, a 12 state region, and it allows us to travel and provide services um, free of charge to the district. So again, if, will someone, is someone able to show me whether or not you're able to chat with me? I believe you might, you should also be able to, oh, okay, Olivia says, I think we can. Um, that is one of my phenomenal interns um, who is also speaking today. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, you should also be able to come off of uh, mute or share your camera to ask any questions that you may have. Um, and please let's, let me know if you are not able to access the handouts. Michelle says, hello. Okay, so yeah, and you can come off mute also. So yeah. Okay, so you can come off mute. You can show your screen. All the good stuff. Um, so please share with me any questions you have um, related to our equity audits as they come to you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we do our equity audits and then how we provide technical assistance. So our equity audits are data walks, as we like to call them. Uh, contextual needs analysis is another way that we refer to them. Um, we like to partner with districts to look at a broad scale of, um, I guess, influencing factors as to the quality of instruction and learning that's occurring at the school district level, the, dis the campus level and the district level. So we do focus group interviews. We do listening sessions and I should back up. The focus group interviews we um, we conduct are with families and community members. We like to talk to teachers and leaders and students. So depending on the size of the district, we work with districts that are um, three campuses, a um, primary, middle school and high school, two districts that have over 350 school uh, schools in their system. So. It depends on the size of the district, but we like to provide time for focus group interviews because we think that we should have um, the voice of everyone in the community. We try to represent um, a full view of who's in the district and how are they being served. Also, we do listening sessions with leadership. Um, we like to make sure that we are understanding a clear, um, that we have a clear understanding of their vision of their goals, of their mission, and like their strategic plan, their uh, district improvement plan, if it's in in place, uh, but what the work is going to entail. We like to have a very clear idea of what um, is ahead of us. Then we like to do um, equity and climate surveys. So these surveys, and there are three of them, there's one for teachers, staff, and administrators, there's one for students, um, at the middle and high school and even elementary level. And then there's one that is for teachers and um, I'm sorry, parents and caregivers. And those questions were developed in conjunction, or I should say in partnership with the Department of Justice um, to address issues of equity, school climate, welcoming school environment, instructional practice, expectation, um, bullying and harassment, um, around those four areas of equity. So our student responses may go from, I believe that all of my teachers believe that, uh, or have, have high expectations for me, to bullying occurs at, and it's on a Likert scale, and may even say where bullying occurs most. Um, it might talk about, or they do, not might, they talk about uh, or ask questions referring to whether or not students are aware of their um, student handbook or bullying reporting process. 
And when we look at all that data, we do a cross-reference. And so we break students down, uh, depending on the case itself, the, um, the situation, we like to look at sometimes non-white students versus white students, and then parents and teachers. Sometimes we break them down. It depends on the demographics. Again, we work with school districts where students of color are a minority minority and exposing their responses may highlight their presence and we don't want to put them in in any form of discomfort um, other times we may be looking at male female if there's a title IX situation going on so depending on that we like to look at those cross sectors of data to see where the disparities might lie so those are some of the ways that we use the data and then following that data so we've done the focus group interviews, we've looked at the climate and culture surveys and equity surveys, and we have looked at district data, we look at district um, policy around several factors. Uh, if we're talking about diverse hiring practices, we look at their, their um, policies for hiring practices. We look at the data, the historical data around who is applying to the district, who is being interviewed for the district, who is being offered a position, and who is actually accepting those positions. And then we also look at retention. For teachers who have been in the district for some time, we like to see uh, or ask questions about why they have decided to stay with the district. And we're also working to help districts partner with um, local and regional uh, institutions of higher learning, especially for recruiting teachers of color. Uh, we know that right now we have a teacher shortage and it's going to continue to, to, to be consistent. So we're also looking at ways to just improve the teacher workforce or in numbers, I should say, increase the teacher workforce in numbers and partner with schools to find out who is in the teacher pipeline, um, get them interviews with school districts and try to make those networking connections for school districts uh, to have a, a more robust um, teacher personnel to choose from. Um, I'm trying to think what else. So our technical assistance can also include, in some cases, helping districts design their equity plan. We are working with several districts right now who have new like chief equity and diversity officers. And though that they are defining those positions as we go, we are working alongside of alongside them to navigate that, um, especially after COVID. I have personally been doing this work for uh, over 10 years now, and COVID was still definitely something that we could not have expected. And so we are still navigating um, a school system in a new environment. And as we return to learning this year, we don't just do teacher training, but we also do leadership training. So principal leadership, and developing effective leadership through an equity mindset. We are also able to offer restorative practices through um, IDRA's uh, EX South. So there are a myriad of ways that we're able to assist districts and work with them to build more equitable school environments. It just depends on the request and that's all it takes is a request, an email, a letter that says, we know that you do this work, this is what we are interested in. And then we begin a conversation, it's as easy as that. And if you do not have my personal email, it is now in the chat. You can also find us here at idraeaxsouth.org online. And I am hoping that I will actually get some questions. And again, this, this session right now, this time frame during lunch is for you to be able to enter any of the gallery walks and ask questions. So are there any questions for me right now? And please do check out the handouts as well. I'm not seeing any, any questions or any chats. I also want to thank you again. I, I, I'm going to be saying that all day long. Thank you again for joining us today. We're so excited to have you all. I see a couple familiar names, but 
those are people that I'm familiar with because we're already working together. So I really want to give you some time to formulate any questions you may have for me about our technical assistance. Yes, you can check in and out into in any of the sessions. Right now, there are five sessions happening, actually, and I can tell you what those five are. There are five gallery walks. So in addition to the session that you are in right now, you may also visit uh, Mr. Aurelio Montemayor and Terrence Wilson, who are talking about our education cafes. That is our family and community engagement model that they um, lead the work and efforts in, and they will be able to um, share that with you. Mr. Hector Bajorquez is speaking on emergent bilingual support. So we do a lot of work around um, bilingual instruction and English learner instruction, and he is sharing that. Then there's this one. Dr. Bricio Vasquez is talking about data walks and dashboards. That's where it gets more technical, where we actually create dashboards um, for data analysis for school districts, and then principal leadership with Dr. Nilka Aviles is the fifth room. And so let's see, Dr. Johnson, how do you introduce your team's effort when you start? Some schools won't understand why the audit is needed. That is a great question. Um, I believe that's Mr. Corley. I'm sorry, I can't see the whole thing. Um, so when we launch an effort with the district, we ask for time to discuss uh, that very um, issue um, or concern with everyone. And I'm, I'm very clear about opening uh, teacher training sessions or anything like that with um, this type of uh, conversation. And so we talk about the need for school districts to reflect on their practices and policies that may be harmful for students. And that just means looking inward at our instructional practice, our co communication um, strategies, whether or not all students are truly feeling supported and welcome in that school environment or district environment. Do the parents feel like they're part of the community? Are they valued? Are they um, engaged with the campus and the district? And so we look at data one of the clearest ways for us to address that concern is looking at data. So you have a school district who um, has remarked or, or is finding that they have an, a 92% uh, graduation rate. And that is commendable. I always have a concern though, where are the other 8%? And who are those students? And so we ask questions around equity such as um, are, are our practices, are our current practices um, resulting in, in uh, success for all students? And if we can't say all, who is it not serving? Who are we not serving well? And so we look at that dynamic. Um, and this is, this is across, again, all of these um, indicators. We look at, in addition to our four main race, gender, national origin, and religion. We also look at socioeconomic status. We look at primary language. We look at whether or not a student is um, receiving special education um, supports because they are very distinct. There are very distinct differences in what supports are needed. And so it, it might be that, that we're providing support, but are we providing support that's being helpful? So the entire process of beginning a relationship with the district, the first thing that I, I request is I, I, I really don't like the term buy-in because I feel like it needs to be about ownership. And so I challenge and charge every teacher, staff member, and I'm talking about paraprofessional to nutrition worker, to bus driver, um, to the coaches, to the team, doesn't matter what subject you teach. If you're here, you're here on purpose. Let's work with purpose. And we talk about how students need to be supported and how we can do it better. 
And until we have true 100% graduation rate, where 100 students are college ready, if they choose to go, where we talk about equitable access and success and opportunity, we talk about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how they all three have to work collaboratively for student success. But until we can say we are at 100% that all students feel or are receiving their, their, their idea of success in schools, then we all have work to do. And therefore, it's, it's about ownership, um, collective ownership of my, so if I'm a teacher, of my classroom, of our campus, of our district, and then the broader community. So we definitely talk a lot about the need to just review. We might think we're doing a good job, but we want to know for sure what, how good of a job we're doing and look for opportunities. I look at everything as like every challenge can become an opportunity. Anywhere that we might be performing lower than we want to be want to be that means that's an area of opportunity an area of growth and achievement that we can be striving for so thank you for your question um kathleen says can you talk a little bit more about what restorative practices look like so for us we do um we do a lot of training for building capacity it's all about capacity building we're always on a, a path of increasing our capacity as individuals and then as organizations and we have the same model for this the schools and districts and state education agencies that we work with so restorative practices in my mind is not it has to be implemented in a whole school approach excuse me we follow the denver guide for implementation over a two to two to three year period where some of the most basic elements are simply the mind shift. There's a paradigm shift in understanding that interpersonal relationships with students between teachers and students, teachers and teachers, students and students, parents and, and teachers, that all of that is, is the foundation for positive um, and welcoming school environments. And understanding, have a common understanding that my actions, my behaviors, my speech, my success are all connected to other people at my campus. So restorative practices is a mindset of operating with empathy in mind, treating each other with respect and understanding that our climate, our school is impacted by each and every one of us, that I am valued and important and that I impact the school environment, the classroom environment, whether I'm in the hallway, the classroom, the bus, the playground, that all of us are connected through community. So in order for that to really manifest, we have to operate as a community and, and have uh, shared values. We have to discuss what happens when I harm the environment or when I might be harmed. So our training around that we have multiple models, but the primary model is a train the trainer, but not in the traditional sense. We train, we have intensive training for um, a cohort of, of restorative leads. We then provide coaching and mentoring over the course of a year for implementation. And then the second year is where we heighten uh, that the application. Because in the beginning, we're talking about building community. That's really, we're tier one, whole school building community. We don't really talk about, if you know about restorative tier two is where there's more um, redirective or, or to address student behavior. And then tier three is more of a return to, like if a student has been put in ISS or even suspended um, or gone to potentially an alternative school or placed in a juvenile uh, facility that upon their re-entry, there's a whole other, um, scenario for tier three. So we start with that tier one intervention, where it's a whole school approach to building community among the entire school district um, and then campus based. So district campus. But my true belief is that you cannot implement restorative practices simply by establishing a peace room that people go to when they get in trouble, because um, that does not 
change behaviors. There's no, um, there is a consequence, but there's no change. And so that's what restorative practices looks like in that students become more self-managing in the community, in the school environment, in the classroom environment, even at home um, through these restorative practices. And a lot of it is really a, the, the change, a lot of the, uh, how do I say it? The majority of the change is on the adult. It's the adult perspective and the adult application of the principles or restorative practices that help guide students into that self-directed um, behavior. And so I hope, Kathleen, I hope that I was able to um, answer that question. Um, let's see. Amanda says, thank you. You're welcome. I am an ED. Oh, OK. And actually in Great Lakes. OK. But very interesting use of building wide equity audit and planning cycle. So listening to others experiences. It really is important. Um, yes. Thank you for as equity audits that there's a it's a it can be a very large or a very um, isolated event in terms of like we're working with one school district, their first phase of their equity audit is just policy. The school board, in fact, there's a team of about 10 members from the, the school district executive level. So the school district level or leadership, it includes two of the school boards. And right now they're looking at three particular areas of um, district policy just to start there because they have established practice has to be supported by policy. So the best classroom strategies and, and um, uh, practices by teachers, if they're not supported by the district policy or if they're um, not aligned or actually counter, um, I guess, what's the word, not supported by the district level policies, there's a there's a true disconnect. And so for longevity, for capacity and for sustainability, policy is really key. And so they're focusing there first. And then we are going to go down to the campus level and do some uh, technical assistance training with them. So that is kind of how it differs among uh, the people that we're working with. Uh, Jacqueline says, um, our school district is under an active desegregation order. I am part of the plaintiff group. Is there technical assistance that you can provide for us? Jacqueline, if you are in, um, well, so the answer is yes. Technical assistance is, is almost automatic um, if you're under a deseg order. Um, are, are you in the EAC South region or one of the other three regions? Um, I can provide the information. If, it's, if you're in the EAC South, then, or I'm sorry, region two, which is the South region, then yes, active desegregation um, orders are one of the principal reasons. I mean, it is the principal reason. The EACs were established as desegregation assistance centers um, out of the 1964 legislation around civil rights um, in education. And like I said, the first were established as DACs and somewhere maybe 15, 20 years ago, they were reestablished as equity assistance centers. And so if a school district is under a complaint or DSEG order has some kind of resolution agreement or consent decree from the Office for Civil Rights, uh, Department of Justice, MALDEF, NAACP's Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, or the Southern Poverty Law Center or any other um, legal entity, then they can request technical assistance from one of the four EACs, um, but any district, like it, it really doesn't matter. I want to make sure that that's very clear. It does not matter if you're under DSEG or not. Now, some DSEGs, they will write into the consent decree. The, the organization, the school district will work with insert which of the four equity system centers names. So IDRA, IDRA EX South to address these areas. But if you are not uh, currently under a desegregation um, decree or consent order, all it takes is sending an email really to me. There is an intake form on our website, the idraexouth.org, um, or you can just send an email that says, we want to increase instructional practice for our teachers, for 
um, diverse learner populations. These are our demographics. What can we do? And we will sit down and collaboratively de design a technical assistance plan, a scope and sequence, an implementation plan uh, for training, um, data review. So especially, I should say that if a school district, if one of your school districts um, has already done an equity audit and the results come back and say, you, we, our recommendation is that you should address this, 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 and this. You can bring that to us and say, look, this is what they're saying. This is the, what the data found. This is what we want to do. And then we can let you know which services we can and, can and cannot provide. For the most part, IDRA can provide a plethora of services. Um, some of ours are consultant based, so they're fee based. But the majority, well, like I said, I have been the director for the past, when did I graduate? I think I've been director for three years. I really can't remember, um, but I've been working with IDRA for 11 years. And in all of those 11 years, not one of the projects that we have had that is under the Equity Assistance Center has been charged a fee outside of two that I can recall only because it was on the um, organization side that they had to expend funds. And so those are applied to travel because we do travel in, in a non-COVID world. Um, if you heard the pre our president's address, I have traveled to every single one of our 12 states um, during this last five year cycle. And so um, where possible, we will come to you. I was in Florida last weekend with, um, I see that Lakeisha is here, Miss Wilson Rochelle. Rochelle. Um, I was in uh, Florida at a conference this weekend to present to a group of um, area superintendents. And so, yes, we travel, we can, excuse me, do things virtually. Um, any, oh, another great thing is that anything that we develop, like all of these handouts today and these recordings, they will all be, um, oh, thank you, Jacqueline. Yes, we, we work with Florida, any state in Florida and the Florida Department of Education. Anything that we provide is free of charge. So the services, the coaching and mentoring, the meeting, we set up communities of practice. We have an online so site called, um, the host platform is called Mighty Networks, and we are able to provide space for um, communities of practice for kind of like Facebook for educators where you can post videos, you can share things. We do a, um, a PBL segment. We also do PBL training for teachers and all of those things are there. Hello, Lindsay. Do you have a question for me? Are you just playing with your controls? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Well, at least we know that you can come off. So that's a good thing. So I'm not sure who is new to the room and who has been here the whole time. So I need to know if there are questions that you have. And then at the in about five minutes, I, I'll kind of start all over. No, not no apologies. This is a it's it's not the same. Um, it's not it's not the same platform, so it's a little different. So we're still kind of learning. But if anyone has a question, please, please, please drop that in the chat or come off of mute and ask away. And this is also a time for you to take lunch. We start back at um, 1.30 in the the next five breakout sessions. So please feel free to jump on and off as you need to for taking care of yourself, bio breaks, get water, get coffee. I definitely don't need any coffee today. Or I should say any more coffee. Um, I'm looking, making sure I'm not missing anything. No, no one-on-one. -on and I'm trying to drop one more handout for you. If I can make this work, give me one moment. Um, okay, in here, no, nope, desktop, 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 desktop.
Uh oh. Okay, let's see. let's see. Okay, I think I got the hang of it. I'm going to drop one more file for you. There it is. It says overview um, for EX South. That also gives you a little bit more information around um, the technical assistance we can provide. And the first document is more about the equity audits and our research behind equity audits. You'll also find in the chat the six goals of educational equity, which were written by Dr. Bradley Scott, my predecessor and one of my dear mentors, um, about the goals of or how to formulate an idea around what educational equity looks like um, across six um, major pillars. And then I also provided the brochure for the EX South that you can um, open and download or save. And Miss uh, Miss Jacqueline Warrior, if you contact me again, I don't know if you, I think you should have gotten this, but I'm putting my email again in the chat. You can email me directly and we can set up a time to uh, discuss the district. And I think that, oh, same for, um, sorry. Oh, and Amanda. Okay, so I have caught everything, I think. Please let me know if I need to start over or if you have any questions in the chat. I will be in this room for the next um, 50 minutes. And I just want to make sure that I have asked answered all questions. Let's see, what is that? Oh, no, nope. check. Thank you, Mr. Dijon. <laughs> oh. It's, it has been, I'm, I'm already, oh yes, can I please start over? Thank you. I will start over. I have no idea what I actually said, but I'll just pretend like I'm beginning from the beginning and therefore I'll say everything. So, oh, okay, give me two seconds to take a breath and get a drink of water. Oh, he hello, Tanya, okay. Please stay hydrated, uh, stay hydrated. Oh, now that's a good question. Let's start there. Thank you, Ms. Jacqueline. Um, what type of jobs are available in this area of equity audits? Um, Kristen, I wish that I had an answer for that. Um, every school district, I would venture to say, I can't speak for all, but I would say that um, equity audits are conducted by a variety of organizations and these are at cost. I mean, I know that the district that I live in, I still have two students, um, two sons who are still school age. I have a middle schooler and a brand new high schooler, pray for me. Um, that our school district can, is um, just put out a request for proposals to conduct an equity audit of the school. This school district has three comprehensive high schools. My daughter, who just turned 21, also graduated from one of these high schools, and she was one of 900 um, graduates. They have the year that she graduated, there were 5,000 students at her school. So, again, it ranges. You have very small districts, very large districts. Um, and everything in between. So organizations that conduct um, equity audits as part of their uh, services provided, that our businesses will charge for the service and they provide a very robust um, in-depth look at indicators and it depends on the district uh, of what they're looking for, but those recommendations are provided and then uh, they're, they're um, left to their own devices on how they um, implement addressing them. So for IDRA, this is part of our larger um, educator services that we provide. So I'm not sure how you would get into that job, but as an equity assistance center, it is something that we provide. All four equity assistance centers, by the way, um, one region one is um, the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. They are located in Bethesda, Maryland, and they have Region 1. We are Region 2, EX South, um, at the Intercultural Development Research Association. Region 3 is the Great Lakes Equity Center, which is at Indiana State University. And then, and they serve Region 3. And then Region 4 
is the WEAC, the Western Education Equity Assistance Center, and they are housed at um, MS Denver, uh, Denver, I cannot, it's MS Denver, I think, MSD. Uh, Dr. Jan Evanstead is the director there. So all of us have a protocol for our equity audits. And as I said um, earlier, I'll repeat now that we perform equity audits as a contextual analysis to identify concerns around, again, for the equity assistance centers, race, gender, national origin, and religion. That equity audit or data walk is facilitated through focus group interviews, listening sessions, um, data, a data draw, not just academic, but uh, we look at discipline, we look at um, retention, graduation, and uh, attrition, attrition, retention, and graduation rates. We look at uh, GT placement. We look at how many students are taking advanced academic classes, specifically Algebra 2 as an indicator for college readiness. Um, so we look at how many kids are going to college. We look at um, socioeconomic status. We look at uh, special education um, supports. Um, you name it, we probably look at it. We also look at facilities, again, depending on the district, we also look at disproportional um, practices in hiring and retaining teachers. So once we do all of that and we provide our set of recommendations, we then work with the district to develop a technical assistance approach and a scope of work that can be anywhere from several months to several years long, always contingent upon funding. Um, as I said earlier, IDRA has held an equity assistance center grant since 1975. They are competitive and they are um, on cycles. So some, it, there were times where it was three years. These later ones have been five years. We're actually entering a year six extension. Given the transition um, in administration in DC this year with um, a new president, and his administration, they have decided to, they decided to postpone this year's competition and moved it into next year. So we have been doing this work as an organization for a very long time, almost the entire life of the organization itself. Um, so again, equity audits themselves um, can also be done in organizations. So uh, I am a math educator by trade who has been, um, I've been, building my capacity for the past 11 years in this work. Um, I also got my PhD in um, instructional practice, uh, interdisciplinary learning and teaching. And so equity and culture responsive practices and uh, culture sustaining pedagogy and intersectionality and multiplicative practices and all those kind of things are part of my own personal study and journey. So a lot of these pieces have come as part of that. Uh, so I'm not sure, Kristen, if that really answers the question, but that's where we are. Uh, so our equity audits, again, provide a contextual analysis for the scope of work that we will develop with the school district. We are currently, and I'm looking at my board, so please don't think I'm being rude. I'm looking at my board so I can remind myself of what we're doing right now. So the types of things that we have going on right now, we're working um, with several districts, um, Specifically, the contact person may be the, and there are a variety of names for the position, but um, district chief equity officers or diversity, equity, and inclusion officers. But that office, a lot of districts um, are reaching out for support in not only kind of developing what that position actually looks like, but in other cases, working with that individual or that group of individuals who are doing the work in the district and providing um, training for them, coaching and mentoring for them. Those are kind of things that we're doing with some districts In others. We are working on um, increasing student and family engagement. Sometimes it's very specific to um, advanced academic programs. If there is a desegregation case, um, that's pending. Sometimes it is around diverse. These are the most prominent uh, desegs that we get from the Department of Justice. There's going to be around increasing gifted and talented participation or advanced academic programs or AP programs. It will be around 
increasing um, the number of African American teachers or diverse hires and uh, recruit for recruitment retention. A lot of school districts that are, uh, and we remember here, we work with districts that are extremely small, like a three school district to districts who are over 350 campuses. So there's going to be a wide range. We have a lot of rural school districts in the U.S. South, um, in Alabama, Mississippi, Virginia, even Louisiana, um, even in Texas. There are a lot of rural districts that, that um, seek our assistance. And so we try to lay out a plan of action that will allow them to increase their recruitment efforts. So they may not have um, a hiring policy. They may not have anything written down around how they will um, actively recruit new teachers or staff. Um, there have been districts that through focus groups and um, conversations with the community have found that they have no teachers of color or in, in some cases, no um, leaders of color. And so we work with them to actively recruit um, from a variety of sources, but learning how to network, learning how to um, promote their school district, because when you have a small school district competing with a much larger school district in a, in a similar area, it's very different uh, for the small dis school district. It's hard to attract teachers. So we have, we also try to help them develop um, promotional materials for increasing their um, uh, presence. How often do you help a district implement changes the audit success, uh, suggests? Anytime we do an equity audit, well, I should say in the last, let's see, one, two, three. I would, I would say 80% of the equity audits that we um, provide or conduct, especially, and when we call them, I call them a data walk. We basically collect a bunch of data from the district in a variety of ways, surveys, focus groups, listening sessions, uh, and then data, we look at the website. In some cases, it's whether or not um, a particular district's website is um, a, a welcoming or useful to all members of the community. So is it translatable? All of those kind of things, like where, where are things um, residing? So that is part of our contextual analysis. It is not just a service. Um, our intent in conducting an equity audit or, or data walk is to provide contextual needs analysis that will then outline the scope of work uh, for our duration of uh, partnering with the district. So I, I really want to say almost 100 um, percent, Mr. DeJohn, because that is the purpose of the equity audit for us. Excuse me, if, um, if we conduct an equity audit strictly for the purpose of conducting the audit, that that's usually not the request, but um, if it were to be so, that's that would be fine. Um, but we do like to make our recommendations. How much resistance does there tend to be, especially if a race issue is determined? Hmm. I'm going to pause before I respond. So that resistance. So. Hmm. I'm trying to gauge resistance. Resistance, there's there's always going to be some resistance, I think, in any district that we could possibly be talking about across uh, the country. There's going to be some resistance for the purpose, um, for the outcomes, for the strategic planning that goes into it. Not everyone sees the big picture and sees that there are usually, unfortunately, usually students who are not being served at the highest capacity. They are not receiving quality instruction um, or supports. So there is resistance. And when race is concerned, we are just very clear in the data that is influencing the, the reporting. And when we set them, when we, I mean, when we set forth the, the information, we try to, we provide uh, dashboards or presentations that provide breakdowns demographically um, to kind of demonstrate the need. And so even in the training sessions, there can be some pushback or, or mis, 
misunderstandings or limited understandings of the purpose. But the majority of the work that we do after the contextual analysis, when we begin the training and we start talking about promoting equity in schools, we do a reflective, we do several reflective exercises that help us center students in the work. So it's not Paula, forget the Dr. Johnson. It's not Paula's opinion that students are not necessarily receiving um, equitable treatment, but the data shows us that not all students are being supported at the same um, rate and the need to address that. If we, it, you know, we, we start with like the mission and the vision of the school district. When it says all students for all of the, um, the Dijon school district, we ask, are all of the students in the district actually receiving this type of, or this level of um, care and instruction? And if not, then that's something that we, we need to be mindful of to work towards. So all we can do is, you know, put it down. It's up to the teachers to pick it up. We provide uh, training and facilitation uh, focus groups. We actually are even um, working with the school district and the school board to implement more of a restorative practice mindset so that it can filter down. So the school districts are doing it, the school board is doing it, and they're hoping that everything will meet in the middle. Um, because in that particular case, it is very much um, just part of the dynamic that it, it's important for them to understand. Has the community ever responded to an equity audit? The community is involved in the equity audit. Um, the, our, in, in the equity audits that we conduct, we request um, community, uh, wor um, not work groups, but community forums. So we do have uh, focus group interviews with students at a variety of levels. We ask for um, focus groups from the teachers and depending on the number of campuses, we ask for representation. We ask for representation across um, cultural and racial backgrounds and to represent all campuses involved. Um, we definitely ask for leadership input. We wanna know what they're thinking because we, we know that that's divergent thinking, right? So I have evidence that students might believe one thing, the teachers are entirely in an in a opposing viewpoint thinking that, like the students might say, I'll give you a perfect example. We had a group where the, student, the teacher said, um, we think that, you know, discipline and, and a disciplining student behavior is very well taken care of on our campus. The students at that campus said, we don't think the teachers discipline enough. We don't think that they address behavior enough. I should say it that way. Um, so we also want to see how parents, what their take on that is. Do they, what do they hear from their students? We can't ask them to put themselves in their students' shoes, but we can ask for their input on what they hear um, uh, as secondhand from the, the students. So we definitely, um, in our district, I mean, in the districts that we work with, we seek out input, qualitative data from surveys and focus groups and listening sessions from every form of stakeholder or every group of stakeholders. So students, parents, teachers, administrators, staff, and then the community and parents. So uh, something that I believe in very strongly is that our schools need to be community schools again. Whether or not I have a student in a school system, if I reside in that school system, that, stu that school should, uh, this is my personal, again, this is Paula right now, that that school should be important to me because there should be learning, uh, I'm, you know, they're impacting our future as a as a community. So I am a homeowner. I live in this neighborhood. I can see my son's school. And before he was there, that school was important to me. So that's my I know that's probably my role as as an educator. But this is a vocation. It's a calling. It's not just my job. So um, we really we really seek to center the students in this conversation. Um, but again, like as we're returning from learning, or returning to learning, uh, so much focus is given to the students, but I, I venture and challenge to expand that thinking. How are our teachers doing? So mental health is important for teachers too. Caring for them and, and being, for a teacher to be in an inclusive and welcoming environment is just as important as those teachers providing the same type of environment for students and parents. Every parent should be able to walk on campus and feel welcomed in that, in that community and to feel valued and listened to 
So um, I do see that uh, you saw a recent school board recommend an equity audit and the community came to the school later and lost their minds about the idea of even doing it since there is not a race problem in the district. So I'm just going to say to that, and thank you, Sharla, the data never lies. That is That would be my response. Is the data, is, I'm just gonna quote Ms. Sharla Williams. Data never lies. The data is the real story of students' experiences. It's often very different from the story we tell ourselves about our students' experiences. Thank you. And I, I believe that's Dr. Williams. I wish we were less averse to what the data tells us. Um, one of the first things, and this goes back to Mr. DeJohn, when you said, um, when you asked kind of like how, how, how the response or what kind of response we get, one of the first things that I share with teachers or leaders or parents or students <clears throat> in um, these small group settings is we have to remember several things. One is as teachers in the room, many times we are in, in um, a space with people who did not have the same kind of educational experience that we did as students or as educators. That's one thing to remember. If we want school to be a positive school, uh, a positive experience for students, teachers, and the community and parents, we have to work to provide that. And it's all of our job. It's all of our job to make school the place to be. As an instructor, as a teacher, it's important for me to teach with passion that I can pass on to my students, especially I'm a math, remember I said, I'm a math educator. So I had to go above and beyond. Um, to have my students want to be there. So I had to build relationship. So it wasn't about them not liking math was less important than them having a strong relationship with me because then the math will come. And that's kind of how I feel about that. And the piece around school uh, students' experiences, data can only tell us so much. Quantitative data can only tell us so much. It is important to capture the qualitative experience behind that. And that is what Dr. Williams is talking about, is that you can have data. If I'm a school district, if, let's say I'm a superintendent and I say that um, I see that 83 percent of my students overall across every grade level that was tested that year passed or even mastered. I am going to celebrate that as a victory and immediately begin addressing the 17 percent that did not. So even if I am a high performing, uh, even if I have a high performing district, someone always has the potential to fall through the crack. And as it is my charge, my personal charge in life to not let students fall through the crack. And sometimes students, here's another point, students may be experiencing academic success, but not emotional or um, mental uh, health success. And so again, we want our students to be, it's a whole school approach. We want students to be healthy, physically, academically, emotionally, and mentally. So if I am leading a school or a classroom or a district where students are not all experiencing that, then I believe that an equity audit is, is, is there to help me. And that's the approach that we take. It would be too easy to walk into a school district and say, they're doing it all wrong. That is never our approach. We always celebrate the wins. We, we find the victories and then we look for the opportunities for growth. Challenges become opportunities. So this, um, so as people address the achievement gap, I see it as an opportunity gap because we weren't doing the best job before March of 2020. So we can take all of those great um, accolades and, and practices from before the pandemic and apply them now. And all that we have learned over the last, what, 17, 18 months, you lose count and I'm a math person, but we take all the good and we move forward. That is why this particular um, uh, uh, convening is called Reopen, Reconnect, Reclaim. We thought about reimagine. I don't wanna imagine stuff. I want it to happen. I want It can happen now. And so, as I said, I believe, we believe as an organization that educational equity is possible. We have to put in the work. And that means 
laying like we have to shelve trying to lay blame or even trying to accept blame or, or take accountability for the history that has occurred in education. We do have to be aware. We have to know what equity really means, that equity is not equality. And that when we talk about equity and try to lead from that focus, that we're really looking to provide or to find ways to improve the education that we provide to students. When we do that, it's not about, it's not about saying, oh, I didn't do this or I didn't know. Okay, so now we know. We know what the situation is, that qualitative and quantitative data, quantitative data is going to inform all of our decision making. And we're going to think about when we sit down to plan to create a master schedule. When we look at who's in those classes, we're going to sit back and think, hmm, how can I improve the diversity of this class? Let's look at um, AP um, English or, or AP Calculus. What is my ratio of girls to boys in those sections? How many sections am I offering? Am I offering sections? Who is in the room? How could I bring diversity to that space? If I look at a campus, which some of the districts that we are working with are experiencing right now, they look at a, a particular campus and find that they have over 50% um, students of color and maybe one teacher of color. So they're asking themselves, how can we maneuver our teaching staff, do they have the certifications and experience to be able to, because you can't just, I know that the, I'm sorry, I think I speak in train of thought. A lot of non-educators think that you can just pluck a teacher from one position and put them into another. It just doesn't work like that, especially at the secondary level. You would not want me to go in and teach a social studies class. So it's important for us to remember um, those dynamics as well. And the fact that we are, are experiencing a teacher shortage just makes this even more difficult. So we want to know, are we building capacity at, the, at each campus uh, across the board? Are we engaging the community to find out what their, what their true needs are? What are they saying? If you, if you really open yourselves, it's not to, if we could reframe, I love reframing, if we could reframe qualitative information, qualitative data from communities, from teachers, from students as being in for, you know, measures of informing. That's all it is. When I go to the doctor, before they do anything, they ask me, are you experiencing any pain today or are you experiencing any symptoms today that you would like me to know about? They're going to do their regular check. But they're asking me, is there anything of concern that you have that you want to bring to my attention? And I'll tell them, I know what they're going to, I know they're going to do it like a, for me, a well woman check. But if I've been having a little pain in my hip or experiencing a little palpitation that's not normal, they can't know that unless I say something. So as educators, it's the same thing. We are the physicians in the room. We have a curriculum, we have a scope and sequence, we have a planning guide of instruction. We know what we're supposed to do. But if a student comes to us with a learning disability or has autism, I have a son with Asperger's, it's important that his teachers know every year, I can't expect someone else to tell all of the new teachers, it, it's important for them to understand his condition because he's also gifted and talented. So he's twice exceptional. So it's important for us to share that with the teachers because otherwise they're going to treat him like everything else is, is traditional. So it's really, um, oh, thank you, Guadalupe. Time to reconsider how to make use of teachers' instructional talent. I absolutely love that. It's, it, again, Teaching from, of course we have standards, everybody has standards, um, but there's also a piece to this that is very personal. And I just think it's important for us to keep in mind, again, diversity, equity, and inclusion means we accept that there are gonna be differences, that's diversity, there are gonna be differences and we should honor, we have to honor that, but we can also be very inclusive of that in that everybody feels 
like they are part of the school community. Everyone feels welcomed in the school community, heard in the school community, and cared about in the school community. And as far as equity is concerned, it means providing the necessary tools and resources for every student to be successful. That's it. And like I said, if, if, um, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. DeJohn. Um, Dr. Khalifa is looking forward to seeing you too. Um, I just, this is, it seems like it should be so easy. We should not have to um, force this issue, in my opinion. If we want to have a successful uh, society, we have to really invest time, energy, resources, in our students' education. And if we truly say that we want to have equity, we just have to make sure that we're doing that for all of our children. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who they are, where they came from. It's it's really beyond that. It's time for all to really mean all in education and beyond. Woo, Charlotte, you, you said it. That is a mouthful. That it, we really have to mean all. Not just the high flyers that are already doing well, we have to seek out those. And, and again, sometimes it's not about race. I want to make sure that we understand that there are white children sitting in or going, that are going to be sitting in our classrooms in the next several weeks who need supports academically, emotionally, financially, physically, uh, mentally. There are going to be students of every shade, every every community that are going to need our assistance. And so um, it's just our charge. It is our charge if we are in this in this uh, line of work to make sure that we support all of them. And so that's all I can, that's all I can say about that. So I will stick around if there are any more questions. Thank you, Faith. Um, I, I hope it was helpful. Please visit our website. Um, there are all sorts of resources. There are, you can search, there's a search bar in every, every page of the IDRA um, website. There is a search bar. If you have a particular, if you want to type in, um, uh, I don't even know, uh, elementary education, type that. Anything related to elementary education will come up. Um, if you want to put a uh, school climate, type that. It'll give you everything that we have. It'll give you podcasts, newsletter articles, um, infographics, reports, anything that we have on it will be there or even on your google search i love google google is our friend if you put in a google search bar idra and then anything that you're looking for it'll give you uh it'll it'll give you all that information we're very good about tagging thank you to christy goodman and the communications team but i will stick around for another uh 10 minutes or so if there are any other uh questions or if anyone needs me to repeat anything or send you anywhere thank you Sharla. thank you thank you so much I'm just, all my adrenaline is leaving now because I just can't believe that you are all here. I can believe it. And I'm, I'm just thankful for it. I should say that. I can believe it because this is good work. Um, thank you for, for allowing it to um, manifest today and tomorrow. And there's still one more breakout session. And then at 2.30, we will hear from Dr. Muhammad Khalifa. I cannot wait. And then tomorrow we have a whole day too. So Please let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to be on mute, but I'm here.
If there are no other questions or comments, then I can give you 10 minutes of your day back. Stretch your legs. You answered a question on how to engage teacher now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Guadalupe. Um, when we conduct an equity audit with the school district <clears throat> or campus, usually it's it's the whole district. Um, but what we do as part of that, we do site visits. So in a perfect world when we we're able to travel, uh, we would go to each campus in the district. And I mean, and I mean each. So if there were 20 schools in the district, we would bring a, a team and we would go visit and do equity audits or we would spend several days and go to each of the campuses. Um, but they participate in multiple ways. So we have focus groups um, that were that are organized um, to, to be as most to be as inclusive as possible of the teaching staff of a district. Um, but we also include in that paraprofessionals. Um, it could be counselors, it could be nurses, but we we ask for campuses to um, select, depending on the size, select a number of individuals who are representative of the campus. And so we also ask them to be um, mindful of race and ethnicity versus gender. So I don't want to see two um, black women if that is a minority subpopulation of a campus. So when they when they come to the focus group, we have a series of questions. Um, depending on the circumstances, we may have separate. So we might have a combined where it's like at large, and then we may have some separate organizational um, meetings, especially like if there's a, a particular population that is not receiving um, adequate instruction or engagement, we may ask for a smaller subgroup. So the teachers participate through the focus groups at large and small. Then we also have a series of um, surveys that we deploy that have a teacher staff component. And, and on there, we have them indicate so that we can talk about specific indicators that are um, being informed by them. Um, and then the other way is in our training sessions, as part of the equity audit from the very beginning, we ask we ask for it's like a rating scale to identify who, which groups, um, how groups rate needs of the district, like which areas of concern they have um, as well. So those are some, that's a multiple uh, pronged approach of how teachers can influence the, the outcome of an equity audit. Uh, we ask about school climate. We ask about um, instruction, teacher, uh, family, like teacher parent uh, relations. We also talk about like areas of need that the teachers feel they need professional development in or what they would or that they are interested in. Um, what else? Instructional practice is a big piece where we we want to know if the teachers feel that they are being um supported in that way and, and what areas of expertise or professional development they're interested in. So I hope that answered your question, Guadalupe. Um, and the same is, is for students, leaders, and parents that we involve all of those uh, communities within an equity audit. You're so welcome. You're so, so welcome. I can close that. I hear a mic. Do you have a question? Is it Omiash? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I was just. Oh, it's okay. I'm just trying to look at the handouts. Oh, okay. No problem. I'm going to mute your mic. Okay.
and we have just under three minutes for any burning questions or needs, any assistance that you need in navigating. There will be a, um, you'll be able to link back to your main agenda page to attend the next session. I hope, hope, hope that you were able to get some answers, but also that you will um, go get something to drink or eat and stretch your legs. Uh, it's very different being online. And I'm saying that while I'm still sitting at my desk, right? Um, but I hope that you're able to at least take a short stretch break before moving into the 130 breakout sessions. And I will share with you again, if you're not familiar, our afternoon equity power breakout sessions, broadening pathways to STEM with Dr. Stephanie Garcia and Mr. Hector Borges. Then we will have Dr. Daniel King speaking on college readiness for all in the pandemic area. I'm not biased because I know everyone who's on program today, but Dr. Daniel King is a phenomenal uh, former superintendent of Far San Juan Alamo um, ISD here in Texas. Phenomenal speaker. Um, Ms. Page Huggins, uh, Duggins Clay is talking about establishing and maintaining equitable and restorative communities. Uh, she's an attorney that we work with. Um, she's a friend of the organization and just phenomenal young lady. Uh, Dr. Altheria Caldera is going to be discussing in strand four, developing racial literacy for teaching ethnic studies. You guys, she is a powerhouse. All of these things are going to be available by recording, but when I say Dr. Caldera is amazing. And then you could also hear from in strand five, uh, two of our fellows and one of our interns here at IDRA uh, speaking on reimagining student engagement, revamping school policy and practice and fostering student advocacy. All three of these young leaders are advocates um, in their own right too. Like I said, our policy fellows with us this year and have testified um, for the Texas legislature. It is ridiculous how much uh, they are gonna bring into the world. Uh, they're all very young, I'm, I'm getting up there, but these are the young folks who we know are following us. And then um, Malivia Mojica, is one of our interns who is a student advocate and now she's in college, but she was an advocate even in high school. And so uh, they understand how, again, policy has to support practice. And so I just, I welcome you to visit any of those. I think they will all be phenomenal. And then for sure, for sure, for sure, please rejoin us in the main plenary session at the end of the day at 2.30 to hear from Dr. Muhammad Khalifa. And you're so welcome. Uh, Guadalupe, if I can call you Guadalupe, um, our, my word of the decade right now is just pivot. Everything has been pivot. I'm a mother. I was a student. I'm going to be a teacher again. I have a full-time job. You have to be flexible. Like I said, challenges, you just have to reframe them into opportunities. And so since we had a couple minutes, I took the opportunity to share with you again where we can go right after this session. So it is 1.20, we're gonna be closing this room. You have a built-in 10, 10 minute break. I thought about you. I wanted to make sure you got up and move those muscles. Um, so please take that 10 minute break, join the 1.30 session and we'll see you back at 2.30. Continue to enjoy. <laughs>